Let's go ahead and pray together. You may be seated or you can remain standing. Heavenly Father, we often get lost in the busyness and the routine of life. We allow it to consume our thoughts and fill our days with worry, and we forget to stop and thank you for all the good in our lives and all you have blessed us with. We have so much to be thankful for, and our hearts are filled with gratefulness for the gift of living, for the ability to love and be loved, and for the opportunity to see the everyday wonders of creation. We want to thank you for those things in our lives that are less than what we would hope for them to be. Sometimes life is hard and we struggle with feeling overwhelmed. Things that seem challenging, unfair, or difficult distract us and pull us away from the continuous reminder that you are a kind and loving Father who has promised good for us. When we feel stretched and empty, help us to remember to rejoice that you are as near to us as our next breath, and that in the midst of turbulence, we are growing and learning. We thank you most of all for your unconditional love and the ways you continue to show us your faithfulness and goodness. God, you are our refuge, our strength, and our salvation. We give you this moment, this morning, and we commit our lives into your hands for the working of your kingdom. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. I don't know if you've had a chance, any of you had a chance to read the book side by side, the missionary book side by side? Anyone? I think my wife has. But that's All right, there's a book, missionary book called Side by Side. We have one copy in the back, and you can also get the downloaded copies. But it is written by uh, Jenny and Vito Monablanco. And uh, Jenny and Vito... Uh, went to a place called Cactus, Texas, and I've talked a little bit about it. But next week, next Sunday, I will be in Cactus, not here. I'll be in Cactus, Texas. Cactus, Texas is a small town uh, like no other town I've heard of anywhere. Town of about 4,000 people in the panhandle of Texas near Amarillo. Um, it has 20 different ethnic groups that speak 40 different languages in a town of 4,000. So um, uh, the people are from Sudan, Somalia, Conga, Myanmar, Mexico, Central and South America, Puerto Rico, Haiti. Two thirds of the people in Cactus are refugees, meaning that they came to our country because of war, because of poverty, because of oppression, they, natural disaster, they came in desperation. They ended up in Cactus, Texas because there is a big, huge meat packing producing plant there. And work there is uh, difficult, but it's uh, available to many of these immigrants. They process over 5,000 cattle a day, employ 300 or 3,000 hourly employees. Many of the people live in Cactus. In Cactus, there is no grocery store. There's a dollar store. I think there's a laundromat. I hope there's a laundromat. Um, no health care, no after school programs or sports programs except that comes through the Cactus Nazarene Ministry Center. A church of the Nazarene saw the need there. The district in Texas came together and decided to create this Cactus Nazarene Ministry Center for the hope of sharing the gospel and empowering people through a variety of ways to help them flourish through preaching, through teaching, uh, English uh, second language, uh, different uh, classes. They, they said, I may even be able to help teach a civics class, which I'm kind of excited about. Uh, hope I get it right. Uh, hope I don't end up getting them sent back to where they came from. Um, but also through a medical clinic that just started in January. And they're offering real help to people, but through the, the gospel is presented. Next Sunday, I anticipate preaching to a church filled with Sudanese and Somalian people, uh, Africans. I preached in Africa when we were in Namibia uh, on our work and witness trip many years ago, and that was quite the experience. I expect this to also be quite the experience. And so uh, I'm looking forward to going to there. Uh, Jenny and Ma Vito Monteblanco came 
in response to God's call in their life. They were from Wisconsin. Well, he wasn't, but they were not originally, but they were living in Wisconsin, pastoring in Wisconsin. God called them to go there. Um, and they served there for a number of years, and now there are new directors there that we're just getting ready to know, uh, introduce ourselves to and be able to there to help. But in the chapter, the first chapter of the book, Side by Side, is entitled Trust. And it begins with their story of faith promise back in Wisconsin. And how that he accidentally wrote the wrong amount on his card. <laughs> and, uh, and then God impressed on him to trust him for that amount. That was more than they could really afford. And that God blessed them. And it was through those experiences of trust that eventually led them down to Texas to participate in that ministry. And so, I, I want to thank you for your trust. It doesn't matter whether we're here or whether we're way off in Texas or whether we're way off around the world. God calls us to put our faith and trust in Him, whether it is through going or whether it is through giving and sending. And so last week we had faith promise cards uh, given out and we had a great response. We surpassed our goal over $21,000. Uh, so we're glad to see that. There's always more. There's always room for more. We can, we, even when we go beyond what the Church of the Nazarene uh, calls us to participate in the general missionary program, there are plenty of opportunities that we have to use the money that is given for missions, whether it is local or whether it is around the world. And so I encourage you to be a part of that, to be a part of, of giving. I encourage you to pray for me this week. Actually, I'll, I'll, we leave on Saturday. And I'll be gone there for, uh, for a week, and so a little over a week. And so we leave on Saturday, so be praying for our, our team as we go down. I am going to have a suitcase out in the back. I'll send you an email out this week. If you don't have our email address, please uh, do that. We just had a meeting yesterday, and I got all the details last night, so I was just trying to put them together. So I'll get the details to you via email. But I'm going to have a suitcase out here this week, and if you want to fill that with some... Uh, Hats, uh, it, it gets cold in Texas. Like next week, it's going to be like in the 40s uh, for the low. So um, many of those, many of the people there uh, need coats or hats or gloves or school materials. I'll send an email out about that and let you know, and you can come and help me fill up a suitcase before I leave Saturday. And we'll give that stuff away uh, to the people down there. And you can participate in that, but you can also participate through prayer. And so I appreciate your prayers uh, look forward to that. You'll probably, uh, you'll hear more of that when I get back, but you'll probably hear more of that also next week. Uh, we'll see what we can do to let you know what's happening. So we're on the story. We're on our, uh, we only have one week left next week. Pastor Stacy will be preaching next week. She'll preach on Revelation. So if you've always, all the answers to Revelation will be answered next week. Yeah. I didn't tell her I was going to say that. She probably will not be happy about that. But anyway, she did a great job. So Martin, uh, we're going to look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10. Uh, Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, uh, told the story about his grandfather who was crippled. And uh, he loved to tell stories, and he was a great storyteller. And one day, he was telling this story about a former teacher and about how he prayed. And this preacher, uh, teacher, when he prayed, he would get so uh, filled with such fervor and intensity that he would hop and dance and as Martin Buber was telling the story about his grandfather, he got so swept up in the story that this crippled grandfather rose up in his chair, stood on his feet, and began to hop and dance. <laughs> and he was never lame again. I don't know that that's true, Martin Buber says it, but that's the way to tell a story. <laughs> to tell a story so that it doesn't just... Um, inspire us, encourage us, but it shapes us, it changes us, it takes away our crippledness, it makes us walk, and that is my goal for the story that we've been looking at all these years, all these weeks, feels like years sometimes, sometimes to you it might, uh, that, that the, we get so immersed in the story, it's not just inspiring, that it changes us, and I, I believe the story we're going to look at today has the potential to not just be something in history that you read about and say, oh, wasn't that great? But it's our story. And I believe it can transform us and take away some crippledness maybe in our lives. And so we're going to look at the story in Acts chapter 10. 
It's a story of the early church. Um, remember the early church on the day of Pentecost, uh, the Spirit of God descended on the believers. They were locked away, a little bit afraid, and then the Spirit of God came on them, and that was the birthday of the church. We always say the day of Pentecost is the birthday of the church. So they were, they were in, their, in their rooms when the Spirit of God, in their upper room when the Spirit of God descended on them. Meanwhile, the city of Jerusalem was bursting with pilgrims and tourists from all over the world uh, because people would come from all over the world for the day of Pentecost. And so you had all these different foreigners in town. They're Jews, but they're from different parts of the world. And when the Holy Spirit comes down upon them, uh, on, the, on the believers, they head out the doors. The doors open up. They head out into the temple courts and they began to praise God. And the miracle that happens is that people coming from all different places in the world, speaking all different languages, hear the people of God praising God in their own home language, their own native tongue. And, and it is amazing. Uh, they, they see this miracle and they begin to think, what is, what is going on here? But it's more than just a, ni a nice little trick. <laughs> It's a tremendous sign of what God is going. It is a signpost, a message of what God is doing. The miracle is the sign of the new age that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's not just the savior of Israel, the people who speak Aramaic or Hebrew, but he is the Lord of the whole earth. He is the savior of the world. And in the church, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're Greek or or barbarian, or Roman, whether you're rich or poor, slave or free, male or female, it doesn't matter. The very diverse people across the world would be united together in a way that no one has ever seen before, that no other organization, no other institution could experience, gathered around one thing, that Jesus is Lord. Nothing would unite them except Jesus is Lord. And so that's an amazing thought. I mean, can such a community really exist? It did and it does. Especially in the earliest Christian communities. The earliest Christian communities, uh, you know, over time, it seems like sometimes the churches became divided into their little groups. But in the earliest Christian communities, uh, people would be a part of the church who, who would never hang out together for any other reason except that they believed in Christ. I mean, remember when Jesus called his disciples, one of his disciples was a zealot who wanted to slit the throat of everyone who supported Rome, and the other one was a tax collector who got his money by collaborating with Rome. I mean, Jesus did that kind of thing. Let me see the two people who are most at odds, who are most likely to fight with one another. Let's put them and be the part of my disciples. But, but that's the intention, that we're going to take this mix of people who think differently and live differently and act differently and talk differently, and we're going to bring them together in a community to show that, that we can all be one in the worship of Christ. And, and that is where everything is going at the end of the age, Revelation. Maybe, maybe Stacy will talk about this next week. Uh, you see people from every tribe and every language there. Not just one, every tribe and every language. I, I mean, I don't know how a racist would ever be a part of the new age. <laughs> I don't know how they would ever live <laughs> when they're going to be worshiping with people so different. Part of, the, part of the draw for me to go to Cactus, Texas is to see what's going on in this crazy, diverse place and to see with people who are living, trying to live that out and, and to, to demonstrate to the world this is the kind of the community of God. And so we read that in the early church, so much of that amazing story where Jesus has taken the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile, broken it down, and now there is only one race, one people. It is the people who are born of new creation, whose spirit is in them, who have made them one. And they are united in a way that is miraculous, which is why Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples if you are one. And so that's, so much of the New Testament is about that because that is not a minor thing. That is it. That is what God is doing, creating this people who come together. And so we read about this in the story in Acts chapter 10, the story of Peter. Uh, Peter is in Joppa. This is 
After Jesus has been resurrected and ascended, the Holy Spirit's on them. Peter and the disciples are going out and preaching. And Peter finds himself in the city of Joppa, which Joppa is on the, uh, uh, the Mediterranean coast in Israel. It's near Tel Aviv now today. Um, Acts chapter 10, verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And immediately the sheet was taken back into heaven. And while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. So uh, the earlier story we didn't talk about, the, these men from Cornelius were, came. Cornelius sent them out to go find Peter. And so while Peter is sitting there contemplating what in the world is this trance where the, where the voice from heaven is telling me to do something that I dare not do, then the knock on the door, the men from Cornelius' house show up. And so we, begin, we follow up verse 28. Uh, well, let me, let me finish the story there. So Peter uh, receives those men into his house. They, they say, we are here to bring you back to Caesarea to come to Cornelius' house. Cornelius is a Gentile. Cornelius is a Roman centurion of all people. He's well respected. He's a God-fearing man, but he's a Roman centurion. The men say, Peter, we want you to, you're supposed to go with us. And the Lord says, yeah, you're supposed to go with them. And so sure enough, uh, Peter and some of his people from his house uh, go with uh, these men to Caesarea. It's a two-day voyage there, two-day trip there. They finally get to Caesarea where they arrive in the house and he finds it full of peeper, people. Uh, Cornelius, this Roman centurion house, is filled with his friends, his neighbors, his relatives. Um, and they're all Gentiles. And Peter finds himself surrounded by these Gentiles. And so, verse 28 of chapter 10, we pick up the story again. Peter said to them, you are well aware, this is after some greetings has happened, and uh, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. I asked why you sent for me. Cornelius answered, three days ago I was sitting in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon and suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house, home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to me, sent to the people of Israel. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed, uh, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead, and on the third day caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by the witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. 
All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So he gives them the gospel. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gent even the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And Peter stayed with them a couple, stayed with them a couple days. And so while Peter is in Joppa praying, he has this trance, this trance where this tablecloth comes down with all these animals and reptiles that were considered unclean by the Jews. And Peter is sold, kid up, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything unclean. The thought of eating unclean, these animals were probably physically nauseated Peter. I mean, when you bite into rotten food, uh, the insular cortex in your brain lights up, causing you to spit it out, causing you to gag, causing you to feel nauseated, causing you to make funny faces. Um, but the insular cortex also lights up when you just think of something disgusting to eat. You immediately have that face, that re re reflex that happens. Uh, so, so, so we know it can be somewhat subjective, right? Because what some of us view as disgusting to eat, other people don't have a problem to eat, right? Have you ever been in different countries and eaten something that uh, people said, here, you got to try this. This is a delicacy. And you go, oh my goodness, I don't want to eat that. I'm getting sick just thinking of that. Uh, some people in Cambodia eat, eat this. Tarantula. Yum, right? Uh, in Japan, they eat the puffer fish. You know, the skin around the puffer fish is very poisonous. You have to have a certain license to be able to cook it, or you may kill people. Uh, and you may want to turn away from this. Some people in Philippines eat a fertilized duck egg. Uh, that's the tamer picture. In Manhattan, they, eat, they, they show these pictures because they serve this in a restaurant in Manhattan. It is, it is gross. The egg comes to you, you drink, uh, it's just... So for Peter, it wasn't, that's called balut, by the way. For Peter, it wasn't balut, it wasn't puffer fish, it was more like this. Pork chops. It was barbecue ribs. <laughs> It was something like this, maybe. Uh, you know, good lobster. Uh, the thought of sitting down to a plate of barbecue ribs for Peter probably physically nauseated him. I can't do that. This is a trained response that he has learned all his life. And it's been going on for centuries, for over thousands years, of over a thousand years. Jews have looked at that and said, I can't eat that. That would disgust me. That would cause me to throw up a little bit in my mouth. <laughs> so, so Israelites, as we know, had the certain food was clean and certain food was unclean. And, and it's very interesting why you study why certain food was clean and certain food was unclean. It really is about, we don't have time to get into this a lot, but it really has to do, do they conform to the class that they belong to? Are they pure? And so you, you, you find uh, an Israelite could eat an animal that had completely split hoof and that chews the cud, uh, cows, sheep, goats, but if they didn't have both of those characteristics like a pig, they couldn't eat them. Uh, you can eat anything in the sea that has fins and scales, but if they don't have fins and scales, then you can't eat them, like lobster. Um, you could eat insects, isn't that great? Um, winged insects, or you could eat insects that walk on all four, but you can't do, do the both, right? And so the symbolic message behind that, and we don't have time to get into this anymore than this, symbolic message of this is purity. 
And there's, there's a message there about purity. It's the same thing concept is seen in prohibitions for mixing two kinds of seed together. You weren't allowed to do that. Or breeding two kinds of animals together. You weren't allowed to do that. Or sewing two kinds of fabric together. Like a wool blend suit. Sorry, can't do that. And the message is purity. You need to be exactly who you were called to be. You need to be pure. You need to be holy. You are human. You are to be human, holy, fully human in all the glorious splendor that hum means to be human. And that is a wonderful message. But what happens when you don't meet up to the standard? People aren't always holy, wonderfully human. We are broken sometimes. We are not whole. We are not perfect. Lepers, people who suffer hardship, people who go bankrupt, people who have sin in their life. And what about all those Gentiles? And, and so that's the issue that the Lord is dressing with Peter. Not really food. The deeper problem that God is addressing is not that Peter was disgusted about unclean food. The deeper problem that Peter is addressing is when he is disgusted about what he considers unclean people. Just as the insular cortex lights up at the thought of certain food, the insular cortex also lights up at the thought of something morally disgusting. Same reaction. So, so you think of something morally disgusting like, like a mass shooting or something like pornography. But, but it can be somewhat subjective. What, what do you consider morally disgusting? A Muslim would consider maybe a woman who doesn't cover her head. Um, someone else may consider, you know, someone who drives a certain way is morally disgusting. Or maybe someone who wears flip-flops to work. Ah, Cal, how do they do that? It's terrible. Some people see a big plate of oysters and they think, ooh, I'm hungry. Some people see a big plate of oysters and go, ah, I'm about to gag. And so it, is, so it is somewhat subjective what our brain is trained to respond to. And what is interesting, that when we think of something morally disgusting, our insular cortex projects to the amygdala. The amygdala regulates fear, aggression, anxiety, causes us to respond with fear, aggression, and anxiety when we think of something morally disgusting. It's probably God's way of protecting us, but not, when it's not under the supervision of the Holy Spirit, it can become very destructive, and we see that. People who get disgusted with someone else be, can become very aggressive. So, so Peter's gag reflex is in full operation when the Holy Spirit says, kill and eat. And Peter, who once told Jesus no about the cross, tries it again. No. I'm not going to do this. I am not going to eat this. It makes me gag. I can't do it. And then the voice says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Let's say that together. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. That is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. And what Peter is learning that this is the new age that the Mosaic, a, the Mosaic law could point out impurities, the Mosaic law could set the standard and the goal, but there was something more that was desperately needed, a new covenant, and that is where God was heading all along, that the Mosaic covenant was a first step, it was a schoolmaster, it was a tutor. But all along, God's goal for Israel was not to be for them to be excluded in their little group, but to be missionaries to the world. But first, God had to create a people out of them. He had to separate them from all the other people in the world. He had to protect them. He had to fight for them. He had to love them. He had to treasure them. He had to reveal himself to them, teach them that they are loved so that they in turn could love other people. Teach them to put their trust in him. Teach them that, that then they will be freed to love when they learn to trust him and they will be freed to live in justice and, and morality. Um, and so the point with, with much of Leviticus code, codes are you need to be a clean people, a holy people, a pure people. You need to live differently than the rest of the world because you have a mission. But the goal was never to segregate themselves off to themselves, but to redeem the world. Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 49 says this, is it a too small of a thing for you to be my servant to restore uh, the tribes 
of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. Is it too small things for me to bring you back when you've been in exile? But here's the bigger point. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the world. Do you think that's too small? That's not too small of a thing. In Christ, God was doing a new thing, a thing he had always planned to do in the first place. As N.T. Wright says, God had acted in Christ surprisingly, shockingly, unexpectedly as he always said he would. <laughs> So the old covenant, the Mosaic law had reached a dead end. It had reached maybe, maybe a better illustration is a cul-de-sac. The people keep going around in circles. They keep sinning and the law keeps proclaiming judgment against them. Deuteronomy complain, uh, proclaimed the curses would happen, come upon you if you did not fulfill the law. And Israel kept sinning and so they are kind of stuck in this cycle of curses. And Jesus comes in and throws himself on the wheel and stops the cycle dead in its tracks. He becomes the curse for Israel. Through his death and through his resurrection, he deals with sin not only for Israel, but for the Gentiles as well. The old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, had served its purpose. Just like training wheels, it's time to get rid of them so we can ride, so we can do what a bicycle was always intended to do. And so Jesus came and brought a new covenant. And now the way to be the people of God is not through following Moses and the law, but in believing in Christ, being in Christ since Christ died to sin, I died to sin. Since Christ rose to conquer sin, I can conquer sin. So it's not by following the law, but by being in Christ and having Christ in me through the Spirit. The book of Hebrews says it this way. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. And then jumping down to verse 14. For by one sacrifice, and I love these words, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. What a line. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and I will write it on their minds. Then he added, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer ne necessary. Jesus came by that one sacrifice. He has made you perfect forever as you are being made holy. What a thought. Look to the person beside you and say, you're perfect. Go ahead. <laughs> As you are being made holy, <laughs> you're perfect in Christ. As you are being made holy. Jesus came to people who felt like they were outside. They were unclean. Lepers, woman caught in adultery, people who were diseased, tax collectors and sinners. They were outside, they were unclean, they were excluded, Gentiles. You couldn't even have to do anything with, couldn't even eat with them. He came to those people and Jesus fellowship with them. He touched the leper and, and he touched the leper because he knew that through the power of God, it's not the sin that will contaminate Jesus. It is Jesus' holiness that will purify the leper. He will cleanse. Do not call unclean that which God has made clean. And when we put our faith in Christ, when we believe in him, we have been made clean through his sacrifice. You are perfect. As you are being made holy. You are perfect. See, see, something about being unclean tells us that we're imperfect. That, that's where shame often comes. It's the sense that something's wrong with me. That I'm, I'm going to be excluded. That I'm going to be ostracized. That there's something deep inside of me that's just wrong. And Hebrews says that Jesus came and scorned the shame. He came and took the very shame he went through the very most shameful, humiliating experience at all because he said, I'm going to walk with you down that pathway and I'm going to lead you through it. And through his death and resurrection, 
and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are perfect forever as you are being made holy. What a beautiful way. You know, in the garden, Eve was tempted by the serpent. And, and the serpent basically tempted her and said, you know, God's lying to you. If you eat the fruit, you're not going to die. If you eat the fruit, you will be like God. God is holding out on you. He does not want you to be like him. He's not a generous God. He's a selfish God. He's holding out on you. He does not want you to have what he has. The only way that you can really get all that you can be, be all that you're intended to be, Eve, is by eating this fruit. In other words, Eve, if you really want to be special, then you need that fruit. And that fruit will make you special. And that is Satan's strategy for sin all the time. Every single temptation. Don't trust in God. You're, you're missing out. There's something out there that, that will make you whole. You're not whole until you have this thing. And, and that thing can be almost anything. For some people, it's success. They just feel like, if I can just be successful enough, then I will be whole. For some people, it's a romantic love. If I can just have the right relationship, then I'll be whole. Or praise, or power, or pleasure. All these things we, Satan puts out there and says, here's the way you can really be who you were intended to be. Because God, you can't trust him. Because he's holding out on you. And so all of us have taken the fruit. All of us have said, yeah, that's the thing that's really going to make me whole. And sin entered our life just like it did with Adam and Eve. And what did Adam and Eve do when they sinned? Their eyes were opened and they saw their sin. They saw their nakedness and they felt shame. And they went off and hid. But God came out to them. And God, of course, knew where they were, but he said, where are you? That's pretty instructive, isn't it? God comes to us, but, but he waits for us to call out to him. Where are you, Adam and Eve? Where are you? And Adam said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I'm, I, was, I felt my uncleanliness I felt my shame. I felt all the ways I am so wrong. And when I imagined encountering a holy God, I had to run because I was afraid of what would happen. And then God comes in His grace and provides coverings for Adam and Eve. Fig leaves, right? <laughs> but that's just, that's just a signpost what will happen in Christ. Christ will come and truly cure the problem of shame, truly cure the problem of sin. He will come through his death and he will, through his experience, through walking with it through us, he takes our shame and buries it in the ground. And through the Holy Spirit, we live in Christ. And in Christ, we are perfect as we are being made holy. And through the Holy Spirit, we live in the Creator. We find our wholeness in Him. And Christ lives through us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we run even after we have come to You. We run from You. Even after we've started walking with you for a long time, Lord, we find sometimes it is our instinct just to run and hide. Because, Lord, we, we feel incomplete at times. We feel that shame. We feel that sin. We feel that failing, Lord, because too often, Lord, we've reached after the idols of the world and we've lived for them and we've allowed voices to dominate our minds and our hearts 
who tell us who we are and some of those voices are our own voices if only I can be here then I will be free then I will be whole Lord in this moment right now Lord we don't want to hear any other voice we have come to hear your voice alone you are our creator you are our redeemer you're the one who loved us who died on the cross for us to set us free we want to hear your voice and your voice is very clear though we may reject it at first do not call anything impure that I have made clean we are not impure we are perfect as your Holy Spirit works in us So Lord, would we receive that by faith today? We receive that by faith today. Just take a moment, maybe just turn your hands upward. If you're feeling led that way, just turn your hands upward and say, Lord, I need to receive that today. I need to receive that, Lord, today. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, would you purify our hearts by faith? Would you purify our hearts from every idol in our heart? Go down to the very root of that. Purify our hearts that we might completely be surrendered to you, that you would be the defining voice in our life. We do not believe the words of Satan. There's nothing out there that's going to make us whole. It is you working in us. And you're going to make us clean. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, by your Spirit, Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your Spirit as we leave this place. And would we live differently because we've been made purified by your, your Spirit. Our hearts are pure. And so, Lord, as we're in interactions with other people, Lord, help us to be with other people and not be dealing with all the junk that we've often so often dealt with. May we be free to love because we have been loved. May we love as, you ha as we have been loved. And I pray, Lord, that you would transform the world through us. We are your vessels. We love you. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>